Hello again, everybody. My name is Mike Thompson. Welcome to the Epic Flight Academy. This is the Private Pilot Ground School course, and we are so glad that you're here watching these videos. Now, to be successful in this ground school course, remember there's three parts. Number one, these videos. Number two, you have to study this material and all the supporting material in our online course. And then thirdly, be sure to talk with your flight instructor about this content one-on-one. -on -one. So what's our topic today? We are talking about the airspeed indicator. When we talk about the airspeed indicator, remember that it is part of the pedostatic system. This is the one instrument in the pedostatic system that receives both pedo air and static pressure air. Now take a close look at this cutaway. This cutaway shows the airspeed indicator face and then inside the instrument it shows this bronze diaphragm. Now this bronze diaphragm will expand or contract depending upon how much ram air pressure is coming into this pitot tube and into that diaphragm. Now remember we said not only the pitot tube goes to this instrument but the static. The static line runs to the airspeed indicator case and you can see that right here. So in the cutaway, you can see that the static air pressure outside the airplane will be the same as the static air pressure inside the airspeed indicator thanks to that static air line. Now, while the airplane is moving through the air, the ram air pressure will come in the pitot tube and extend, expand that little bronze diaphragm. And you'll see that diaphragm is connected to a series of linkages, little gears and levers, and they're very precise little linkages. And those little linkages will move the dial on that airspeed indicator. So the faster the airplane goes, the more ram air pressure in the pitot tube, the more that diaphragm expands, the more it moves the little indicator and indicates a higher airspeed. Now notice how we worded that right there. It indicates a higher airspeed. What I see on the face of this instrument is the airspeed indicated by the instrument. So what do we call that as pilots? Simple, we call it indicated airspeed. That is indicated airspeed. Now there are several specific airspeeds that we're interested in as pilots. When you work with your flight instructor, you're going to start to memorize some specific airspeeds for your plane, in particular the Cessna 172. <clears throat> but a couple of these are reminded to us as pilots by colored tapes on the airspeed indicator. Now, when we look at an old round style airspeed indicator, we see colored sections on that airspeed indicator. Notice that we see a white tape, a green tape, and a yellow tape. In addition, we see a red line. Well, what about if you're flying the G1000 in the glass cockpit? Here's an example of the airspeed indicator from the G1000. You're still going to see those three colored tapes. They're just moving up and down in that G1000 airspeed indicator. So let's go back to our round dial and look at these colored uh, arcs, you know, and, and, and see uh, how we define them. The white arc on the airspeed indicator is defined 
at the bottom by a speed we call VSO. That's landing speed, uh, that's stalling speed, I'm sorry, stalling speed in the landing configuration. That's VSO. The top of that wide arc is defined as the speed we need to be at or below to extend full flaps. That speed is VFE, so FE for flap extension. Now let's take a look at this green arc. <clears throat> the bottom of the green arc is defined by VS or VS1. We think of that as the stalling speed in a clean configuration. In the 172, that means flaps up, or it's a specified configuration. As far as we're concerned right now in the 172, we're just going to call that our clean stalling speed. That is the bottom of the green arc. The top of the green arc is a speed called VNO, and it doesn't mean no, you can't fly here. Yes, you can fly there. It's called the maximum structural cruising speed. And that moves us up into the yellow arc, and at the top of the yellow arc, you see the red line. Well, what do you think that is? Makes perfect sense. Red line, stop here, no go, can't go any further. That's the maximum airspeed for this airplane. Now, when we talk about stalling speeds, I want you to remember, while two of them might be depicted on the airspeed indicator, don't forget, the airplane can actually stall at any airspeed depending on its load. We'll talk more about that later. Review this with your flight instructor. The aircraft stalls at the critical angle of attack, not any specific airspeed. There's a very important airspeed that we've talked about previously, and it's called VA. The little a stands for acceleration. VA we refer to as maneuvering speed, and if you take a look at this round dial airspeed indicator, where is it marked? The answer is, it's not marked on the airspeed indicator. Well, that's interesting. If it's such an important speed, why is it not marked on the airspeed indicator? Who remembers? The answer is because VA is always changing. VA changes with the weight of the aircraft. So, so far we've talked about a cutaway of the instrument itself, and we've looked at some of the colored tapes and meanings there. Now, the final topic for today is going to be the different types of airspeed. Remember when we talked about looking at the face of the airspeed indicator? We said the needle indicates the airspeed, hence the name is indicated airspeed. Well, there's several other airspeeds we have to remember, and here's a memory aid I want you to use. It's called iced tea is a pretty cool drink. Now, who likes iced tea? I don't know about you. I live in Florida. I love iced tea. The memory aid here is iced tea is a pretty cool drink. Let's walk through this acronym to help you remember these different airspeeds. So the first letter in ICE-T is I, that's indicated airspeed. Well, that's where we start. Remember, we were just looking at the cutaway of the indicator? And that's what the indicator gives me. It's an indicator, it indicates airspeed. That's the beginning. Well, if you follow this little arrow down, you see the P, and then back up to the, the big C. The big C in ice T is calibrated airspeed. How do I get from indicated to calibrated? Well, I take a little detour through this little P here. This P stands for indicated airspeed being corrected for position error 
and instrument error. Now there are tiny little errors introduced into my airspeed indication because of its position in the airplane relative to the position of the static port and the pitot tube. And you know, there's lines connecting this, little metal lines or plastic lines, and every time the air moves through that line, there's little tiny errors introduced. If we correct for those errors, we get to calibrated airspeed. So indicated airspeed corrected for position and instrument error is calibrated airspeed. From the calibrated airspeed, we go to the capital letter E. E stands for equivalent. Now, we have to take a little detour here through that little letter C. What does that mean? From calibrated airspeed, we take a correction for compressibility to get to equivalent airspeed. Compressibility, what do you mean? At speeds approaching 200 knots and greater, there's so many air molecules trying to jam themselves into this pitot tube that that air starts to compress a little bit. That introduces a compressibility error. When that compressibility error is accounted for, we get equivalent airspeed. So we've gone from indicated correcting for pressure, uh, I'm sorry, position and instrument error to calibrated. And we've gone from calibrated by correcting for compressibility, we get to equivalent. Well, we're not to the end yet. The last letter, the last big letter in the ice T is T. That stands for true airspeed. That's what we're really after. What truly is the airspeed of my aircraft in this atmosphere? Well, the way we get there is we take our equivalent airspeed and we are going to correct for the little detour down here through the little letter D stands for density. When we correct for density, we get to true airspeed. Remember, density talks about pressure and temperature. Remember the atmospheric density being affected by the pressure, how high or low you are in the altitude uh, in the atmosphere, and the temperature of that air. If it's colder, it's more dense. If it's warm, it's less dense. So from E, we take a little detour through density and we finally get to our true airspeed. Now, I was out flying with my 90-year-old mother one time, and we were looking at that airspeed indicator, and she said, do you mean to tell me, with a straight face, young man, that the speed on that instrument is not the actual speed of this airplane? And I said, yeah, mom, that's true. <laughs> that may or may not be my actual speed, depending on a number of factors. And she was so confused. She thought, oh boy, this piloting stuff is pretty complicated. Well, there is a fair amount of complexity to it. Remember, review the online course and review this with your flight instructor. So that's iced tea, pretty cool drink. Believe it or not, you're not quite done yet. There's one speed left. Oh my goodness. Could there possibly be more? Well, wait a minute, it's not quite that bad. The final speed we wanna talk about today is called ground speed. Now, there's nothing we really do to calculate ground speed. It's not part of our iced tea, pretty cool drink formula. The ground speed is dependent entirely upon wind. So imagine this, I'm flying along at a nice even 100 knots, and we'll make it really simple and say it's 100 knots true airspeed. I've got wind aloft and it's from behind me. Pilots call that a tailwind. Well, if I'm flying at 100 knots and I've got a 20 knot tailwind pushing me along and I look down at the ground, my speed over the ground 
is not 100 knots. What do you think it is? That's exactly correct. It is 120 knots. Now my airspeed is, my true airspeed is still 100. My airplane, as far as it's concerned, is doing 100, and it is through the air. That's exactly correct. Over the ground, it's 120. Now, let's turn around and head the other direction. Now, I've got a 100 knot true airspeed and a 20 knot wind from the front. Pilots call that a headwind. I look down at the ground. What do you think we're gonna see? We're traveling over the ground at 80 knots. In other words, an 80 knot ground speed. Well, what about the airplane? Still at 100 knots true airspeed. So you can see how ground speed is not related to our ice T formula, but the ground speed is critical to our flight maneuvers and our cross country calculations. Well, folks, that just about wraps up ground speed. Let me give you one final review question before we go. Hmm, let's see. If I wanted to take the indicated airspeed from my indicated airspeed indicator and convert it to calibrated airspeed, what am I correcting for? Well, there you go, folks. That's it for airspeed indicators today. Talk to you next time.